Hello everyone and welcome to this sort of interlude video in our lecture series on the Koopman operator. So what this video is about is to draw the connection between finite dimensional spaces and infinite dimensional function spaces. And for those of you who have a very strong background in mathematics or functional analysis or, or more theoretical concepts also in, from engineering, this might be not new, but maybe you are from an area where you have more applied research to do or you're more interested in finite dimensional concepts and this function space perspective and these observable functions are new to you. And so for, for those of you who, who would like to make this transfer a, bit, a little bit more precisely, this is what we're going to do. So we have on the left a couple of concepts that are very, very well known in finite dimensional spaces. In a minute, we are going to extend all of these to the infinite dimensional setting. And I'm going to gloss over a lot of details because the main idea is to, let's say, take away the fear that infinite dimensions pose additional significant problems. But there can be really a lot of technicalities, but in principle, conceptually, there is an extension that can be very useful and we will need to use it if we study the EDMD algorithm for yeah, extended dynamic mode decomposition and to, to approximate the Koopman operator from data. So let's start in the finite dimensional space. So we do have a vector space, uh, Rn let's say, which means that every element of the space is a vector that has n entries. So n real numbers that determine well, the value of the vector. Or in a, in a plot, this would be the point in, in space where we place it. And based on this, we can study uh, length or angles between different vectors and so on. And so for these concepts, what we do need is, for instance, inner products. Yeah, so what you see is V times W, also known as the dot product um, or scalar product. Uh, what we do is we multiply component by component and then sum them up. So V transpose W would be uh, a, a, an equivalent form of writing this. And this inner product can be used, for instance, to determine the similarity between two vectors. Right? So if they are perfectly correlated, this will have a large value. And if they are uncorrelated, this will have a small or in the end maybe negative value. If they're orthogonal, it may have um, value zero. Right? And so this is also the, well, the formula for determining angles where we approximate the cosine by computing the inner product between two vectors and then normalized by their length to see that if it's one, we have perfect agreement. So angle would be zero. If we have zero, then orthogonal vectors and they have degree, uh, angle of 90 degree. All right, and then based on the inner product, one can simply define a norm which would be the inner product of a vector with itself and then taking the square root. So what you see is this the, the standard length concept that we are used to in, in 2D or 3D, let's say. Okay, and then this part is going to be really important for reducing functions to finite dimensional spaces, but it's in itself a relevant concept when we want to reduce data or want to identify structures. For instance, in the principal component analysis. So the, the underlying idea is that every point or every, well, let's say, vector space can be defined or is spanned by a basis um, which consists of n linearly independent vectors. Right? So this could be the standard Euclidean basis, which would mean that this point V is determined by, well, however far we have to go along the first axis and then however far we have to go along the second axis. But we can take any other basis as well, so the blue one B1 and B2 would be, well, these are linearly independent, so it's a valid basis as well. And you see that we could take roughly three times the B1 direction and then once the B2 direction to arrive at this point. And so taking different bases or switching bases is also something that's really important in all sorts of machine learning algorithms where we simply you know, transform coordinates in order to have a better way of analyzing data. And so the principal component analysis would be to lay perfect bases into a given data set so that the leading eigenvectors are most important. Right? And so what you can do then is you can simply ignore what's left uh, by the other ones. 
So this is what we do in, in such a projection step, meaning that we only consider the part of V that is described or contained in this subspace that is defined by B1 in this case. Okay? So this inner product simply is sort of the projection of the value onto the spaces. And then, so right, if you take this vector, for instance, V, then the projection would be um, the part that is expressed by this B1 direction. Okay, And so what you get is um, this element, and then we can, since this is a number, we have to multiply by the basis element again to give us really the length in this subspace. Okay, and so here I was a little bit confused at this point because this is not an orthogonal basis, so we might run into problems. It's easier if we have an orthogonal system, but anyway, this is something we can easily do in any coordinate system. Okay, so now we want to transfer all of this into the function space setting. And before we do so, let's have a look at a small example and then make this hand wavingly, and then I'm going to formalize what's on the left step by step. Okay, so let's look at this function that we want to approximate the superposition of sine and cosine functions, and let's try to, well, it's a function, so it's defined at infinitely many points in space, between minus one and one in this case. Anyway, so we cannot define it by n points as we did here. It's an infinite number of, of points, if you wish, for every x we can choose. And so what we would like to do is, we would like to study not all possible functions, which is very complicated, obviously, but maybe consider this function only within a subspace, which means that very similar to this concept here, we would be interested in the part of the function that can be modeled by restricting it to a certain basis. And what we're going to do here is we're going to study the basis of Hermit polynomials, right? So you see these, there's a constant function, then there's a linear function, quadratic, and so on. So it's a polynomial function uh, basis, but these are orthogonal to one another. That means, so the inner product, which this one, which we need to define for functions yet, is zero between these functions. And what you can study then is how much information of this original uh, dashed line is contained in this specific basis element. So this part here, the projection part, basically. And again, we're going to, to study this later uh, in more detail. So what you see here is, for instance, the first six of these Hermit functions and the, the, the projection, or the, let's say the, the best approximation of the white function by this specific basis function. And you see, well, it does a rather poor job. So the, the constant function would give you the mean, which is the, the closest you can get. And then the linear function puts a line through, through the plot and so on. So not very helpful on their own. However, well, we do not have to restrict ourselves to a one-dimensional subspace, as we did in this example, but we can add these up. And so what you see in the final step here is e the superposition of more and more of these basis functions. And what we can see very nicely that the more of these basis functions we get, the closer we get to the original function. Only that we have not defined it in form of a well, continuous function, or it still is, but it is described by these basis functions plus the coefficients. So this would be the basis functions now, and this would be the coefficients, so the relative importance of these individual Hermit polynomials in order to um, you know, reconstruct the original signal. And this, as I said, was rather hand-waving, so let's do this a little bit more formal now, and consider, for instance, L2 spaces. So in contrast to this finite dimensional space, this is something like you know, a set of functions that map from the real numbers to the real numbers and would be bounded integral. So what we can have, if we integrate this function squared over our domain of interest, omega, whatever we're considering, this was minus one to one in the example we just had, and then we say this has to be bounded. Okay, so this is the definition of this L2 space. So it's, well, all functions that have bounded 
L2 norm, but we will get there. All right, and now we have this one-to-one -one relation. Here we had n entries, and here what we have is, well, let's put this like this, infinitely many entries. Uh, because we have a function, something like, sine of x for x in 0 to pi or you can think of many many examples right so whereas here we have n entries here we can define this at infinitely many points in space all right but still we can do all these tricks if you wish okay so if we're talking about the inner product now um, here we had a multiplication point wise and then sum up here, we also have point-wise multiplication. So if we're considering the inner product between two functions now, then simply we have phi of x times psi of x. No, but the sum doesn't make any sense. So we need to take the integral now, which is basically, if you wish, the sum if you get this, raise this n to infinity, so there's a the relation again. So the x, right? So you see, actually, not such a problem. And in the code I just showed, the projection step, so this one would just be to compute this integral using a numerical algorithm. Okay. So, and then, basically, everything else follows very, very straightforward. So the norm of a function um, excuse me, the norm would be given by, I know it's not the two norm, so the standard vector length, let's say, but it would be the L2 norm in this case, is defined completely analogously, so it's the inner product of the function with itself, and then taking the square root. So again, easy one-to-one -one correlation. Um, yes, and now this is where things can become really tricky, but um, you see that, again, it's sort of an extension. Um, here we have n linearly independent vectors, and here we have a set of infinite basis functions, infinitely many. So let's do this again in quotation marks. What it just means is well, if it's a function space, and if you want to be able to express any element of this function space, we need infinitely many basis functions to superpose to get functions, right? We have seen in the numerical example previously, taking the first eight Hermit polynomials, we can approximate this function rather accurately, but it's not surprising, I guess, that if we take more and more complicated functions that still may satisfy this condition, we need more and more basis functions. In the limit, we need an infinite number of them. But, well, this is what you can do, right? So a very popular example in this is the Fourier basis. Right, so a function psi of x can be expressed by a constant and then a sum over sine and cosine terms. So this would be a k cosine kx plus b k sine kx. Right? And so this is rather known. If we have a, a function that satisfies certain properties, we can approximate it to arbitrary accuracy using a Fourier basis. And then the question is always, if we're talking about numerical algorithms and efficiency, can we get rid of this infinite sign here and choose a reasonably small number? And so this is what we do in image compression, for instance, expressing images by Fourier coefficients, but only a few of them, and then reconstruct this later on. So uh, this brings us already to the last step. Um, if we want to do this projection step, we can proceed exactly as before, right? So our approximate function c hat of x, right? Here we had our approximate vector, which was the projection onto, of the vector onto the basis element, and then, you know, 
gives us the coefficient and then how much uh, multiplied by the basis function. And we can do the same here. So if we would do this, then we would take the projection, so the inner product of psi onto the constant function times the constant function. So this would basically give us the A term, well, the constant, plus additional terms, right? So what we get is plus the projection of our function onto cosine. And now I cannot write cosine x because this is an integral over psi of x and cosine x. So it's the entire cosine function, which gives us this um, times cosine x plus, and then now we can proceed. Obviously, we have infinitely many ter terms. So psi sine, well, let's go like this, dot, 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 at the kth uh, term sine kx and so on. So, well, obviously there would be more writing to do, but I guess you get the idea, right? And so, again, we get these coefficients. This one here would be a1. This one here would be the bk coefficient. And so you see that this concept is very, very helpful because we can, and if we're talking about numerical algorithms and data, we can express a function in a basis. And all we need to store in a computer is these coefficients. And if we're talking about a linear operator like the Koopman operator, then the manipulation of the function becomes a manipulation of these coefficients, which then becomes a matrix vector product, but we will get there uh, soon. And so a thing that is really, really important is the error between the function that we have here and the true function. Right here is also clear, we can talk about projection errors. So the principal component analysis would give us vectors that have the smallest projection error. And here we can study the same quantity, the error, let's denote by E, would be something like the L2 norm between psi and the approximated function. Okay, so this concludes our video. I hope that it helps a little bit to show that actually there's a very straightforward extension from finite dimensions to infinite dimensions. And this is nothing to be afraid of really, and this is what is the underlying workhorse behind the extended dynamic mode decomposition. Um, and by the way, behind all sorts of finite element techniques and so on, wherever we want to approximate functions on a computer, we use a set of basis functions like Fourier or head functions if we're talking about finite elements. And then instead of working with the function, we work with these coefficients. So. Stay tuned for the next videos where we will use this in a lot more detail to really approximate the Koopman operator from data. Thank you.